Good morning, everyone who's in Brazil. Good afternoon to our colleagues in Europe. My name is Rafael Schwind. I'm an attorney in Brazil, professor of administrative law, and I was a visiting scholar at the University of Nottingham a few years ago. Welcome to the webinar series, Brazil and the GPA, an event held by IDP with the coordination of professors Sue Aerosmith, uh, Marçal Justin Filho, and Cesar Pereira. First of all, I'd like to, Cesar Pere uh, to thank Cesar Pereira again for the invitation. It's a great honor to host today's session on the topic, types of contracts, offsets, and subcentral entities. Today's topic is very important due to uh, lots of reasons. First, Brazil has different legal regimes to different types of public contracts, so we can expect that the accession to the GPA will have different impacts on all these contracts. Second, regarding offsets, the Brazilian legislation encourages uh, local development by a lot of different instruments, such as the use of domestic content, for example. It can be a problem because on one hand, Brazil can use these instruments because it is considered a developing country under Article 5 of the GPA. But on the other hand, we have the general principle of non-discrimination on Article 4. Third, uh, the central entities uh, in Brazil have their own rules on public procurement. Specifically, uh, the state-owned enterprises uh, have each one of them their specific rules uh, that can be very different uh, among them. So as you can see, we have a lot, of, lot to cover today. And fortunately, we have with us today four brilliant professors, Alessia Vicario, uh, a Brazilian attorney and professor of administrative law, Felipe Pelletier from the WTO, Peter Trapp from, from the University of Nottingham, and Alexandre Aragão from the University of the State of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, each speaker uh, will have 20 minutes for their presentations, and after that, they will answer the questions from the audience and from myself. So I, I invite the audience to send the questions through the chat. Uh, without further delay, I'd like to introduce you uh, the first speaker, uh, Professor Alessia Vicario. Professor Alessia Vicario is an attorney in Brazil. Uh, she has a master's degree in law from the Federal University of Minas Gerais and has published uh, a lot of articles and books about pu public procurement in Brazil. Uh, Professor Alessia, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here and you have the floor. Thank you, Rafael. Good morning and good afternoon to all those participating on this panel and who are watching us here in Brazil and abroad. I would like to congratulate IDP, Instituto Brasileiro de Direito Público, and the University of Nottingham as co-host of this seminar about Brazil and the GPA. I've watched most of the lectures so far. You've been putting on quite a show with so many experts in enlightening presentations. I'd like to especially congratulate and thank Cesar Pereira, Marçal Justin Filho, and Sue Arasmith, for the invitation to speak on this panel about types of contracts, offsets, and subcentral entities. And my colleagues here on the panel too, hello. In 2016, I was engaged in a consultancy to the European Union with my colleague and friend, Professor Marcos Nobrega, which was carried out for nearly two years. This was an amazing opportunity to become more acquainted with the GPA and especially to understand how far or how close Brazil is from complying with the legal aspects of the agreement. We worked on various issues, starting from the structure of the Brazilian public administration, central, central, subcentral, and other entities with special attention to the SOEs, the state-owned enterprises, the general framework of the Brazilian procurement system, the explicit and implicit barriers for the assessment of domestic bids by foreign companies. In what touches our legal procurement framework, Professor Vera Monteiro presented a very detailed overview of the Brazilian system. And Professor Marçal Justin Filho pointed out, pointed out the measures necessary for its harmonization uh, with the GPA. In a few words, uh, I would say that in general, 
We comply with the principles and guidelines of the GPA as a template of international best practices and procurement. In this aspect, it is possible to mention that our legislation provides awarding methods similar to those of the GPA, open, selective, and limited tendering. We also make use of electronic bids and portals with transparent information in the course of the proceeding. Although there is a lack of efficiency in the feeding and maintenance of the portals by some subcentral entities, especially. Uh, we have a fine system of administrative and judicial tools for challenging the decisions. We are though a little messy with too many laws spread around law 8666, which is a result of the attempt to change this law, seeking for a faster and more efficient proceeding with less formalities. Although such attempts never made it to the end, the system has been subject to a few alterations through the introduction of other side laws applicable to specific scopes, which are now being consolidated by the Congress in Bill 1292. <clears throat> also, our constitution and legal framework contain provisions of non-discrimination of foreign companies in domestic bids. Article 37 of the Brazilian Constitution provides the principles that must be applied to public procurement, which are compatible to the GPA principles, equal treatment, legality, morality, publicity, among others. Since Amendment 6 to the Constitution in 1995, our legal, our, our legal system provides non-discrimination treatment between national and foreign companies in domestic and international bids carried out by the Brazilian government. The corresponding provisions, they are set forth in law 8666, article three, paragraph third, forbids the inclusion in the RFPs of clauses in violation of competition or provisions pertaining distinctions related to the nationality of the competitors and commercial, legal, or other discriminating criteria or treatment between foreign and national companies. This is the basic rule. Article three, paragraph second, brings a slight first exception when it provides as tie-breaking criteria, the preference to goods and services produced in the country, produced or offered by Brazilian companies produced or offered by companies that invest on research and on the development of technology in the country. So in a general way, the legislation reassures the participation of foreign companies in domestic bids on equal footing with the national companies. But we know that the devil lives in the details. It is not uncommon to find indirect and implicit barriers in the technical specifications and tender documents. As Marcel mentioned, the GPA shall be the ideal opportunity to clear these indirect barriers because the basis of the agreement is effective reciprocity, equal treatment and non-discrimination. So there will be no room upon the enforcement of the GPA by the Brazilian government for narrowly drawn specifications designed to exclude foreign bidders. In relation to offsets, uh, the first thing we should note is that for many years, our public policies in procurement were designed to protect the internal market in a, a, an almost literal application of Article 219 of the Constitution. As a national asset, the national market shall be fostered in all aspects aimed at the country's technological independence. Law 12349 of 2010 created a series of margins of preferences to products and services produced locally apart from those preferences applicable, specifically applicable to small enterprises. Article three of law 8666 was amended to include the principle of national sustainable development and the preferences to Brazilian manufactured products as later regulated by decree 7546. A series of approximately 20, 
three degrees, de decrease contemplated products such as heavy construction equipment, medication, hospital equipment, trucks, shoes, and others. According to the information of the Secretary of Development and Production of the Ministry of Development, Industry, and Trade, in 2012, these purchases reached the amount of 2.5 of billion reais. And the largest purchases were made by the ministries of defense, air force, army, and health. <clears throat> this uh, by Brazilian, uh, it was a result of the international trade politics of the government within Plano Brasil Maior from 2011 through 2014, focused on innovation, national production, and designed to, of course, to increase competition of the Brazilian industry in the national and international market. But differently from the Buy American Act, that is a walled garden since agencies may only purchase from nations with which the US has entered into trade agreements, Brazil operates as an open garden because the nationality of the company is not considered for the purposes of preferences, but only the origin of the products it's manufacturing in the country. In other words, Brazil adopts non-preferential rules of origin. But anyway, the majority of these preferences were not renewed by President Michel Temer and, and Brazil made the option of taking a new track towards international trade, specifically in relation to public procurement as we are now discussing. But we can expect that at the time of accession to the GPA, Brazil will make use of the offsets as authorized in Article 5 of the agreement and as it is entitled to as a country under development in order to accommodate the need to support certain strategic sectors of the internal economy by means of protective clauses. It's important to know that these offsets authorized by the GPA, they may only be used for the qualification to participate in the procurement process and not as a criteria for awarding the contracts. The offsets are already authorized also in paragraph 11 of article three of law 666 that allows the RFPs to provide commercial, industrial, technological or financial compensations in favor of the public administration, such as co-production, license production, subcontracting, investments in industrial and technological capacity, transfer of technology, training, commercial or industrial counterpart as defined by the federal government. The offsets, they are commonly adopted as we all know in relation to the sectors of defense, health and infrastructure, energy, telecommunications, transport. The most recent uh, Brazilian legislation has indeed emphasized the fostering of the development of the national industry through, for example, the PDPs, Partners for the Productive Development, which is a program carried out by the Ministry of Health for the contracting of the transfer of technology from foreign labs to the national public labs. Uh, we buy the medication and vaccines, and at the same time, we incorporate the technology for local production. Another example is Law 12598 of 2012 related to products and defense systems, which determines, among other conditions for the creation of the, the called EED, Strategic Defense Company, that the technology must be continuously produced in the country. For that, the company must have as, as, as its objective, the development of activities such as research project, development, industrialization services, and include sale or resale only in connection with such industrial activities. The company must have industrial premises in the country, make available in the country scientific and technological knowledge either owned or acquired by means of agreements with an ICT, scientific and technology institution, and also ensure continuous production in the country. The IPEA, Institute of Academic Economic Research, a public foundation attached to the Ministry of Economy has published the document entitled, Politics of Offsets in Public Procurement and Exploitation 
uh, of May 19, uh, 2019 as a text for discussion of this, this, this subject. Anyway, from 2016 on, the shift of political orientation in relation to the Bi Brazilian has been confirmed through the change of the status of the country towards the GPA from observer to a possible actual party uh, in the agreement. And the final negotiations for that shall though involve discussions on possible offsets as authorized by the GPA and by the Brazilian legislation. But uh, when we're talking about trade agreements such as the GPA affecting public procurement, uh, besides these economic implications, there are important legal affairs to be considered. <clears throat> I'm talking about the types of contracts covered by the GPA, goods, services, and works, construction works, a huge market uh, where the expenditures of the central and subcentral entities and those of the uh, SOEs uh, as other entities, uh, as we, we worked on uh, during in 2016 with the European Union, they are on equal footing. I mean, they spent the same amount. Uh, and the pandemic exposed the need to develop our system currently based in contractual prerogatives of the public administration and to migrate into a more contemporary method of dealing with public contracts. Michel Fromont says that administrative law in Brazil is like a bee. It has picked all the flowers in the world, the ones from the North American common law and those of the Roman tradition law. Uh, despite the influence of the common law in the 1891 constitution, which carries uh, the North American spirit and also the same justice uh, organization system in its content, our legal system has been absorbing the French influence since the first decades of the 19th century. That is reflected in the idea of the superiority of the so-called public interest. This notion has been evolving though uh, in the recent years towards the culture based on consensus and contractual obligations. That is a renewal of the classic French concepts of special prerogatives based on the puissance publique of the public uh, contracts in the direction of a consensual administration, legal certainty of the relations based on performance, risk distribution, and balance of the contracts. This notion is uh, basically in force in the delegation contracts and it is still evolving for works, goods, and services under law 8666, which are the scopes covered by the GPA. The legislator of the G differential regime, the RDC, missed the chance to make this change at once, since the RDC contracts are typically performance contracts. But on the other hand, as Rafael mentioned, law 13303 of the SOEs, the, it treats the contracts of the SOEs as private contracts. Although the culture and the behavior of the public administration is still developing in this sense. So, and now uh, closing my presentation, it is clear that apart from the adjustments on a few issues, uh, related to the, uh, to the awarding proceedings, Brazil will need uh, to make a very special effort, specifically on this transition uh, related to contract execution and performance when contracting goods, services, and works from foreign companies uh, who have a very different culture on this issue. Uh, thank you very much for your, for your attention, Rafael. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Alessia, for, for your presentation. Uh, I think you were uh, very precise when you say that in Brazil, we, we are a little bit messy with so many side laws. Uh, we have RDC, we have uh, the laws on public uh, uh, enterprises. So uh, I, I think it, it will be very challenging on Brazil's assessment to the GPA. Uh, you also observed that um, many rules on by Brazilian were not maintained during the last government. So maybe Brazil is aiming uh, to go through a different track on public procurement. 
which in my opinion is very positive. So I think uh, your presentation was uh, very precise. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, our second speaker of the day will be Mr. Uh, Philippe Pelletier. Uh, Professor Philippe is legal affairs officer at the World Trade Organization Secretariat. Uh, he supports the Secretariat team with uh, WTO Committee on Government Procurement and Negotiations under the GPA. Uh, Professor Filippi, you have the floor. Well, good morning, everyone, and bon dia. Uh, let me just say that it's a pleasure for me to be with you today and to share this panel with uh, Alicia, Peter, Alexandre, and, and Raphael. Um, uh, I would also like to extend my gratitude to the organizers, in particular, uh, Caesar and, and Professor Aerosmith. This is uh, an extremely interesting and timely series of uh, webinars. Uh, before, uh, let me just start sharing my screen. So just before I, I, I turn to my slides, let me just mention the usual disclaimer. Uh, today I'll be speaking in my personal capacity and uh, needless to say the content of my presentation is not intended to represent the positions or, uh, of the WTO nor of its uh, member states. Um, <clears throat> now the main objective really of my presentation today um, will be to emphasize the overall importance for Brazil, but also for any other exceeding countries to really carefully study the GPA market access commitments. Um, this is in order to better understand the existing flexibilities in, in terms of approach to coverage and coverage itself, but also to better understand the general expectations from the other GPA parties. So in other words, being familiar with the existing market access commitments and the detailed coverage of the annexes will not only help you to better prepare and defend your uh, negotiating strategy, it will also help you to better understand the GPA parties' uh, general expectations for exceeding countries and also help you to better identify a potential landing zone for your own negotiations. So that will be the main, uh, my main message today. Um, now let's have a look at my slides. Um, <clears throat> so the GPA is first and foremost a trade agreement, a market access tool. So when you join the GPA, what do you get actually when you join the GPA? You get legally assured and enforceable market access rights to the GPA covered procurement market. So how big is the GPA covered procurement market? Well, the most frequently cited figure uh, is around 1.7 trillion uh, US dollars annually. So just think about it, this is huge. It represents more or less 2.5% of the world GDP. And this market has grown uh, over the last few years with exceeding uh, countries, and it will continue to grow with future accessions. We can just think about uh, China and Russia, just to name a few. So my main point here is simply to say that the GPA covered procurement market is big and this is expanding, okay? Now, if you would like to know a little bit more uh, about the details and, and the value of what is covered by the GPA, I can simply encourage you to go on the WTO website and consult some of the GPA statistical reports. There are a number of recent statistical reports there. As some of you may know, uh, the GPA parties have an obligation to notify for each year statistical data regarding their procurement covered by uh, the agreement. These are public documents and they represent a very useful source of information. Now let, let's turn to the, main, uh, to the main part of my presentation. As you may have noticed, I uh, already mentioned GPA covered procurement about 10 times in the last three minutes. So one of the questions you may have is actually, what is GPA covered procurement? And, and this is potentially the uh, most important question that your negotiators will have to deal with in the accession process. So let me try to shed a little bit of light um, on this concept. And let's start by the very beginning by looking at the text of the agreement. So here you can see that article two of the GPA basically states that the agreement applies to any measure regarding covered procurement. So what it means, it means that the GPA only applies to covered procurement. 
What it also means, it means that the GP does not apply to non-covered procurement. So this is, in other words, um, it means that for GPA parties, but also for exceeding countries, when they join the GPA, they retain their, their uh, policy flexibility for non-covered procurement. The GPA only applies to covered procurement. Okay, so now what is covered procurement? And to better understand that, we need to look at subparagraph two here. And uh, let me try to summarize that uh, quickly. So for the purpose of this agreement, covered procurement means procurement for governmental purposes of goods and services as specified in each party's annexes to the appendix one. So here it says that the details of the coverage of goods and services will be specified in the parties annexes. So let's keep in mind the parties annexes. Um, then subparagraph so says by any contractual means, this is quite important, but not the focus of my presentation. Subparagraph so C says for which the value equals or exceeds the relevant threshold specified in the parties annexes. So it means that the overall value of each procurement will have to be above the relevant thresholds and the thresholds will be specified in the parties annexes. So again, the annexes are extremely important. Um, and subparagraph D says by a procuring entity. And there's a cross-reference here to article 1.0 where basically they define procuring entity by meaning any uh, entities listed in the parties annexes. So again, the importance of the annexes. And uh, so paragraph E says that that is not otherwise excluded from coverage. Uh, in paragraph three, that's the national security exception or a parties annex uh, or a parties annexes to appendix one. So again, um, this is a reference to the notes and the general notes that are included in the parties annexes. So, um, there is a lot of, there is a good number of important, but also cumulative elements in this definition. So let me try to uh, simplify it a little bit and summarize them. So, okay, um, bear with me for a few seconds here. Um, to know if a specific procurement is covered by the GPA, you basically need to answer affirmatively to three main questions. So the first question is, are the specific goods and services being procured covered by the GPA? So the goods and services covered by the GPA are specified in um, the annexes four to six dealing respectively with goods, services and construction services. So if the answer to this question is no, then this is not covered by the GPA. But if the answer is yes, then this is potentially covered and we need to move to the second question. The second question is, is the overall value of the goods and services being procured above or below the, the specified threshold? So the thresholds are specified in the annexes. And if the answer is below the thresholds, then this is not covered by the GPA. If the answer is yes, then again, this is good. This is potentially covered by the GPA and you need to move on to the third question. And the third question is, is the procuring entity undertaking this procurement covered by the GPA? And the covered entities are listed in the annexes one to three and the deal uh, with central, sub central and um, the other types of entities. So if the answer to this question is no, this is not covered by the GPA, even if we're talking about covered goods and services above the threshold, we need a yes to those three questions. If the answer is yes, then uh, it is potentially covered by the GPA. You may simply wish then to um, double check if this is not otherwise excluded, for example, in the notes or the general notes, okay? Uh, just before I move to the next slide, uh, I think this is extremely important just to stop here and, and fully uh, understand that no GPA party covers all of its procurement market, okay? And, and I think this is also fair to say that no exceeding candidate will be expected to cover all of its procurement market. So the biggest part of the ne negotiations between exceeding candidates and the GPA parties will be spent on defining the precise scope of the procurement market that will be covered 
by the exceeding country. So now let me just try to be a little bit more concrete and give you a summary of review of the GPA parties coverage, okay? But just before I, I start on the details, let me make a few important points. First, there is no predetermined or uniform level of coverage commitment. In other words, there is a lot of flexibility and pretty much everything is up for negotiation. At the same time, market access negotiations are conducted on the basis of mutual reciprocity. In other words, I think this is fair to say that GPA parties would have certain expectations, market access expectations, and generally speaking, they would be looking for a market access offer that would be more or less comparable or equivalent to their own coverage. So this is why this is so important to carefully study the existing uh, GPA market access commitments. Okay, so now what do you find in those annexes? Um, now I, I will simply follow the order of the annexes and I will start with the entity coverage. Um, Overall, there's a lot of entities covered by the GPA. Uh, it could be estimated between 5,000 to 6,000 entities. There's a lot. The entities are separated into three main categories, um, the central government entities, sub-central government entities, and some kind of a catch-all category called other entities. Uh, let me just say a few words about each of those. With regard to uh, the central government entities, so what do you find there? We're talking about the centralized entities. For, for example, if you think about uh, a country uh, with a federal system, we'll, we'll be talking about federal ministries and departments. You can think about Ministry of uh, Education, Transport, Finance, Health, um, et cetera. But very importantly, the great majority of GPA parties will also include um, their ministries and departments of defense and uh, related army, with a, a very specific ex uh, exception dealing with national security. I'll come back to this when we talk about the coverage of goods in, in just a few minutes. So the coverage at this level by the GPA parties is pretty much, is quite comprehensive, okay? So um, one, I think it, it is fair to also say that uh, uh, similar expectations um, can also be expected from um, exceeding candidates. Now at the Annex 2 level, it deals with sub-central government entities. So depend, depending on your constitutions, here we're talking about um, states, provinces, territories, cantons, um, administrative regions, and it can also go down to um, the uh, municipality or city level. So pretty much all parties have offered uh, coverage at this level with only three exceptions, but those three exceptions, they do not have uh, sub-central government levels, okay? Um, the uh, coverage at this level is not as comprehensive as, as the coverage at the central government level, and some parties do not cover all of their central sub-central government entities. So um, I, I think, it's fair to say that there's some flexibility at this level in the negotiations. Okay, the third annex deals with the other entities. So what do we mean by other entities? Uh, essentially, these are the entities that do not fit in the first two annexes. We're talking about um, entities dealing with public utilities. You can think about the supply or distribution of drinking water electricity, you can think about the ports, um, airports, um, public transportation. Um, this is also a very importantly where you will find most of the state-owned enterprises, the SOEs, and you can also find additional entities like universities, um, hospitals, um, museums, etc. There is a good level of flexibility, I think, um, in, in the negotiations at this level the uh, coverage uh, varies uh, quite a lot between the GPA parties and this is less comprehensive than um, the other two uh, annexes dealing with um, entities. 
Okay, this is all I wanted to say with regard to the um, entities. Let me just say a few words about the annexes here, about the uh, coverage of goods and services. Annex four deals with the coverage of goods. And here, um, the principle is really straightforward, pretty much on, on all of the GPA parties cover all goods except otherwise specified. So basically this is what we call a negative list approach. It would say we cover the universe of goods except the following uh, exceptions. Um, there's a major exception and, and I already referred to a little bit earlier. It refers to national security or uh, military procurements. And basically here, um, that will be the opposite approach. So the countries that are covering, for example, the Department of Defense or armies or things like that, they will basically say that everything is excluded except the procurement that will be specified in a positive list of non-sensitive procurement items. So um, this is a very interesting part of the agreement. And, and um, obviously, as an exceeding candidate, it can be quite useful to have a, a look at those positive lists of non-sensitive items to get some um, inspiration. OK, with regard to the coverage of services, here, um, there's a bit more flexibility. Uh, some parties are using a positive list approach where basically they just say the following services will be covered. Um, and usually they will use the uh, United Nations CPC, Central Product Classification System, to define those services. Um, or you can use a negative list approach where basically you say all services are included except the following uh, exceptions. I would say like the majority of GPA parties are using um, the positive list approach. However, the most recent um, uh, exceeded countries have used a negative uh, list approach. So here there's a little bit of flexibility in the negotiations. I would only mention that it's important to bear in mind that the number of GPA parties have included a so-called reciprocity note with regard to the coverage of services. So what it means, it means that essentially those countries are saying that a specific uh, services sector included in their schedules will be covered with respect to a specific country only to the, um, to the extent that the same service sector is covered by um, that, uh, that country. In other words, uh, for example, if a, a, an exceeding country has an offensive interest in a specific service sector, uh, uh, it, it would also make sense to also include that specific service sector in their own uh, service commitments. Uh, now, with regard to construction services, they are included in Annex 6. Here, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, pretty much all of the GPA parties cover uh, the full Division 51 of the UN CPC Prof, with only uh, limited exceptions. Um, so that's interesting to note for exceeding candidates. Uh, something to mention that is quite recent and, and that was added at the conclusion of the revised GP is, um, um, is that four parties are now covering explicitly uh, BOTs, built operate transfer contracts or other forms of PPPs, uh, 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 public-private partnerships. So this is quite interesting also to note. Uh, let me just conclude by saying that in those annexes, you find notes and general notes. Uh, this is a very important part of the uh, negotiations and also part of the, um, the coverage. What do you find in those notes and general notes? So basically they can be used to add clarity. So if something is important for a specific government, it can be added like for greater uh, clarity, that specific type of procurement is covered by the agreement, or the opposite, for greater clarity, that specific type of procurement is excluded from the agreement. This is also where uh, parties will um, uh, address gaps in coverage. So for example, if uh, a GPA parties, uh, party is not entirely satisfied with the coverage of another party, they can add a country specific note and basically they will reduce their own coverage with regard to that party um, uh, with that note. Um, this is also where you will find 
um, the, um, the derogations in sensitive areas, for example, um, SMEs or other set aside programs. Okay. So I realized now that I already uh, shared a lot of information with you, and it may already sound a little bit overwhelming. This is why I think this is the right moment for me to uh, give you at least a good news. Um, here, this is a very useful tool. This is called the eGPA, and it can give you a very quick and user-friendly access to the uh, GPA market access, uh, including the detailed schedules and annexes that I've just mentioned. So I strongly encourage you to, uh, to, to find it on Google and, and simply try it. You have the URL there. This is quite user-friendly. I'm using it almost on a daily basis. So I know the time is short, so let me just make a few concluding remarks. So basically, I'll just simply summarize the main points that I've made um, a little bit earlier. Um, uh, here, um, the GPA covered procurement is large and this is expanding. This is a fact. Uh, no GPA party covers all of its procurement market. This is also what is being expected from exceeding candidates. The GPA rules only apply to GPA covered procurement markets. So you, uh, the GPA parties and exceeding candidates will retain their policy space uh, for non-covered procurement. There's no predetermined or uniform level of coverage. So there's a lot of flexibility, but remember that the coverage negotiations are conducted on the basis of mutual reciprocity. Um, there are some general market expectations, and this is why this is so important to carefully study the existing GPA party schedules. And please have a look at the eGPA tool. This is a great tool. That's all for me, thanks. Thank you, Professor Filippi. Uh, I think your presentation was very successful on giving a very broad and detailed uh, uh, explanation about the GPA coverage. Uh, a lot of a lot of uh, doubts that I had, uh, I don't have it. I don't have them anymore. Uh, you're, you were very clear. Thank you very much. Uh, I think Brazil's assessment will be uh, very complex uh, because we have, for example, uh, five thousand municipalities in our country. And we go from Sao Paulo, which is a, a city with more than 15 million inhabitants, to uh, little, uh, very small uh, municipalities with no more than 500 uh, inhabitants. So this is a very complex uh, reality, a very complex environment. And this will be uh, certainly very challenging on Brazil's assessment. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have now our third speaker of the day, uh, Professor Peter Trapp. Professor Peter Trapp is an attorney with practices in London and Brussels. He's a senior fellow uh, with the Public Procurement Research Group at the University of Nottingham and head of the Unity for Corruption and Public Procurement of this uh, uh, group the public, research, uh, public procurement research uh, group at the University of Nottingham. So it's a great pleasure, a great honor to have uh, Professor Peter here with us. And Professor, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rafael. I have to say that was, that was an, interesting, um, an interesting introduction. You noticed that, that they made me head of corruption, not head of anti-corruption. I can't tell you how many congratulatory notes I received <laughs> when, when that appointment was announced. So I just send out my bank account details, obviously. Um, so first of all, I want to thank you very much. Well, thank the organizers very much for having me, for inviting me um, to this, uh, this series of webinars. Uh, it's an informative and uh, very interesting series of webinars. I've, like Alicia, I've managed to watch a few of the webinar so I can see the, the value, I've understood the value of having these. And of course, I'm very privileged to share the platform with the speakers that, that we have today. I'll do a share screen as well because uh, we've got very broad topics, obviously, um, uh, today. Oops. Um, but I've been asked to deal with a, a very specific question, which is um, state-owned enterprises. Um, although, as we'll see, and as Philippe already mentioned, um, they're not actually defined. We'll not find uh, this term used anywhere in the GPA. 
Uh, so we're using the term state-owned enterprises, but nobody in the GPA, well, the GPA text itself doesn't do that. So let me, um, let me go. Okay, now for the purposes of, of today's presentation, um, and if you don't mind, I think I'm going to do a back to front presentation because clearly we need to know what the results are of, of being covered as an SOE by the GPA, but I'm not sure that's the most important issue that, that we are, we're facing um, at this, at the, in this context where Brazil is going to be seeking um, uh, accession to the GPA. But I first want to deal briefly with the consequences of, of SOE coverage under the GPA. And by that, I mean, to the extent that an SOE is covered by the GPA, what is the difference in What difference does that make? What is the difference in application under the GPA? There is a difference. Um, and so I, I just want to cover that very briefly. Uh, but secondly, and as I say, I think what the most, what is perhaps the most important question for today's discussion is the extent to which SOEs are covered by the GPA at all. There is no definition, Philippe mentioned it, I've said it already, uh, but in the absence of any definition of a state-owned enterprises, um, how are they covered if they are covered and what are the implications of coverage? What does, it, what does that mean for the negotiating process? Because that I think is what um, we are uh, talking about or what we're interested in. So let me cover first the, the back end of the story, which is, if you are covered, if, if, if an SOE is covered by the, the GPA, then what are the consequences for that? And I should say that the consequences are the same for Annex 2 and Annex 3 entities. So if it's sub-central or if it's other entities uh, covered. So in our case, um, state-owned enterprises. And really what it means is there's some added flexibility in the procedures that they may apply. And for me, it's quite easy to talk about this because I'm from the EU. Well, I was from the EU. I'm not anymore, as you know, and we, we left, we decided to go. But to the extent that I can still be considered as being or having been part of the EU until very recently, it's very similar to the rules that we applied in the sense that we have uh, utilities coverage and that, that, co that, that offers flexibilities which are almost identical to the ones that appear under the GPA for Annex 3 um, entities. So there are probably uh, four, five main, uh, main uh, flexibilities. The first one is advertising. So the main, the main trigger in any, in any procurement, the notice, the publication of a notice of procurement, in this case called intended procurement. For state-owned enterprises, as for all other entities, central and sub-central, they have to be produced in a paper medium, and Appendix 3 of the GPA of the offers will indicate what publications you will find uh, these uh, notices in. Uh, but in the case of state-owned enterprises or Annex 3 entities, it is encouraged that these notices be published by electronic means and be free, but it's not required. It is required for central um, entities, centralized entities. Secondly, there's a notice of planned procurement. And this is really what we call an indicative notice in Europe. It's, it's, an, it's a notice that you would publish at the beginning of the year to say during the coming year or the, the next financial year, this is what we're intending to buy. It gives advance notice, at least that's my opinion, it should give advance notice to suppliers of what is going to be bought. So when normally when there is a notice, um, a, a notice of intended procurement, everybody's ready to bid. But in the case of um, state-owned enterprises, they can actually use that notice as a notice of intended procurement. So there's no need, again, to issue or to publish another notice, provided, of course, all the information is given up front and everybody knows that that's what's going to be the case. But that's quite a, quite a, a time-saving and cost-saving uh, in terms of many of these entities. It's the same thing happens in, in the case of multi-use lists. This is what we would call qualification systems. And it was, in, I think, in the earlier drafts called a qualification system. Uh, so this is really a list of suppliers or contractors that a procuring entity might have. Um, and if you advertise for, uh, sorry, if, there's a, if you advertise for inclusion in a multi-use multi list, then that can be used also as a notice of intended procurement. So once you say, please come and join our list of qualified suppliers, our multi-use um, multi list, 
then we will use this to issue invitations to bid at a later stage and we're not going to advertise it any further. And that's perfectly possible. Uh, provided, of course, as with the notice of plan procurement, all the relevant information is given, everybody knows um, how this is going to work. And perhaps more importantly, only those people appearing on that list, multi-use list will be invited. So it's not, you can't then use it to do an open procedure in any way, it's a, it's a closed list and everybody knows that that's, that's where they're going to be, that's where they're going to find um, the possibilities arising. Um, the time for submission of bids, well, given the, um, the, the, uh, the, the areas in which, the, the sectors in which these are entities usually operate, and I'm thinking about utilities, but of course it isn't only utilities, um, the time for submission of bids can be fixed by mutual agreement. So they can decide how, how long it's going to take for a bid to be submitted. Uh, and if they don't have an agreement, then it can be set, but it can't be set at less than 10 days. But this is far, far shorter than the time for submission um, that's required or as a minimum for the central um, government. I would just mention the higher threshold triggers. That's not really in the GPA. It's not, a, it's not a, an immediate consequence of the um, of, of, of being a covered state-owned enterprise um, but generally in the annexes the thresholds are higher when we're looking at annex three uh, entities um, it's about 400,000 mostly for goods and in terms of construction it would be five million euros but uh, five million SDR uh, but there are the higher figures have been negotiated so in the case of Japan and Korea for example in the case of Annex 3 entities, they have put the thresholds for construction services anyway at 15 million SDR, so considerably higher um, than the general, the general threshold. Um, so that, that's all I really want to say about the consequences, because I think what we're interested in is more about how the SOEs are covered. As I've said, and again, as Philippe mentioned, there is no definition in the GPA. Um, so really, how, how are they covered in that case? In the GATT, there is a reference to state enterprises, um, sometimes referred to as state trading enterprises, uh, but that's more in the documents that, that, that accompany it and more in the, in the literature, if you like, is called state trading enterprises. But the, the reference in the GATT is to a state enterprise. But it's mostly there in terms of anti-avoidance. So, it's sort of saying you can't you can't delegate to a state enterprise, um, you know, the procurement function of, of, of the state and then hope to avoid the anti-discrimination provisions of um, of the GATT. And that was reproduced in the GPA of 1994. That's not the case now, obviously, because cover coverage has expanded. But the GPA 1994 had a very similar anti um, avoidance provision. So if it's not covered in any, oh, so there's no reference or definition in GATS either. So we're left with, although we all talk about state-owned enterprises or state enterprises, we don't actually know what they are. We don't know how they're covered. Um, so what we have instead, what we're left with, if you like, is de facto coverage under Article 24C, which is um, that um, annex, which is a catch-all annex, as, as Philippe described it, um, which covers all other entities whose procurement is covered by this agreement. So it's not done by any special mechanism, it's just the result of the general coverage me me mechanism, which is the, the sort of general um, negotiation process for coverage of um, any entity under, under the GPA. As I said, it's not a matter of, of principle. There's no agreement on definition from the early uh, GPA uh, negotiations. This isn't just necessarily um, the result of, sorry, the case for Annex 3, the negotiated um, process applies to all of the appendices and annexes. And so it's not, it's not unusual um, in terms of Annex 3, but I think it's become more important or it's become um, maybe more a hallmark, if you like, of how Annex 3 coverage has been attained. The bigger concern not as a matter of principle, but the bigger concern has been much more with securing access to markets of commensurate value. So what the different parties have been looking at is say, well, you're offering this many entities and the value of this, of this market to us is maybe a, a, you know, $10 million. Uh, we're, you know, you, we're offering the same. 
Um, and and if, if it's not an equivalent economic value, then there will be some renegotiation. Either we will withhold some of our entities or you will add to them. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day whether they're central, sub-central or um, state-owned. They're added just because of their value. Um, and I think this bargaining for entity coverage has always been a, a hallmark of the negotiations, particularly of the earlier negotiations. But it became, um, I it, it reached fever pitch, if you like, during the Uruguay round negotiations between the EU and the US uh, when they were discussing utilities. And there, there was a dispute over the real value of the parties offered, offered to each other, especially in the utility sector. So they were looking at, well, you know, you're not offering enough for our suppliers, you need to add some more. Um, and so the US was adding some of its, to the extent that it could, because it had, a, it had a certain problem with covering some of the entities because of the federal nature of the country. Um, but it said, well, we will add some more entities. The EU said, well, that, or the EC as it was there, that's not enough. We need some more entities in order to bring up the value of your offer so that we feel that we're getting a fair crack at the whip. I mean, of course, this is called flexibility. I call it horse trading. I mean, I think this is really hard-nosed bargaining. And what happened in this, which was a dispute in the end between the EU and the US, is they decided to give this over, or hand this over to a third party, as it was, it was a, um, a, an accounting firm that made um, a real-time valuation of the offers that were made by each party. So they went through and just said, well, the value of these contracts is, S by, is X by this number of, of entities and, and the same on the, on the other side. And finally, when they had the real information on the real value of the contracts, then they, create, they, they set out to do a memorandum of understanding between the two countries, setting out what the coverage would be, particularly of utilities and state-owned enterprises. And I think this was important because actually it prompted improvements in the offers by other parties. And to some extent, this MOU and the coverage that resulted from it um, effectively acted as some sort of, of, of template or model, if you like, for the coverage of other parties. And I think it's worth looking at that. And it's, it's important to understand that this really was a question of horse trading. I mean, flexibility in negotiation, but this is hard bargaining. I mean, that's what it was. And although it's, it's less fierce, I think um, now, I think the idea is still the same. It is a question of getting equal equivalent value. Now, as a result of this negotiating uh, dynamic, if you like, there is inconsistent coverage. The lack of definition meant that Annex 3 is not really limited to what we would call public undertakings in the EU, in the, in the EU for example. So uh, an entity which is controlled or owned by the state or a public entity. That's what I would call a, a state-owned enterprise, but it, it's not limited to that. Some countries even, even include state-owned enterprises in their Annex 1. So there are some countries, I think, which have uh, postal administrations which are set up as companies. That's a state-owned enterprise, but it's covered as central government under Annex 1. And some put public administrations in Annex 3 um, because some of the utilities are state, uh, are part of the state and therefore send you know, public administrations and they're put into um, Annex 3. So you can't say that the Annex 3 coverage is limited to state-owned enterprises. If they're there, they're there to make up the numbers. As far as I'm concerned, they're there to make up the value. You can't, as a matter of principle, say Annex 3 is about state-owned enterprises. But in practice, we can identify what is in Annex 3, apart from the, well, even if they are public administrations, they would generally fall under what we call the utility sector. And this covers, um, I think, as Raphael mentioned, um, it would be uh, water, energy, transport, telecommunications. In the EU, we also cover postal services, but I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a development, a recent development. Um, but in the, in, the, in the EU, the utility sectors, what we cover are public authorities. So again, what you would consider to be central government and public undertakings. Within the EU itself, we also cover private undertakings that are operating on the basis of special or exclusive rights, but that has not been part of the EU offer. That's limited to entities operating in the utility sector, which are either public authorities or public undertakings. But it's not only the utilities that are covered by Annex 3, it also covers other state-owned enterprises which are not operating in the utility sector, 
but are still government owned. And the example I've put here is Japan and Korea, which cover entities operating in the printing, trading, chemicals, mining, construction, banking, and tourism industries, as well as those operating in, for example, railways, electricity, and um, telecommunications. The result is a kaleidoscope of, of reciprocal coverage. Um, it's not, you, you can't simply say, well, reading the text of the GPA, well, this is what the GPA requires, and this is the list of the entities. No, because there are, as, as we heard already, these are all based, the negotiations are based in reciprocity or more accurately, the reciprocal economic advantage. So you have to be very careful in reading these annexes. Um, they, they, are, they are based on reciprocal advantage and you have to read all of them in order to understand what the coverage is. And the process by which this is done is where, where, where they use a positive list, um, then different countries will withhold specific entities from their coverage commitments. So for example, Canada, um, has done that for all of its Annex Three entities in respect of um, the EU. There's a reason for that. Canada can't cover utilities because they're subject to provincial governments and therefore there was a, a, a sort of a, a constitutional problem with them covering. So there there's an unequal um, coverage. Korea has restricted access to railways for some countries, I think Switzerland and Norway, and the US has um, got some restrictions vis-a-vis um, -vis Japan. The other way of doing this is where it's not covered by list, and this is really in the case of the EU, where they cover a category. So they cover a whole utility sector. So it's all the entities operating in the water sector or the electricity sector. Here, what they do is they withhold coverage on a reciprocal basis um, to a whole category of utility. That's the way they've done it. Um, and this is the case with EU, Iceland, Liechtenstein, Montenegro, Norway, and Switzerland. Now, apart from Montenegro, all the others are, if you like, within the European sphere. So it's either the EU, the EEA, or EFTA. So they all, they all have a very similar um, legal framework, and, and that's probably why they have a similar approach. Montenegro um, is, is, is applying to join the EU at some stage, and I think its legislation is also reflective of um, the EU system. So that's probably why um, they're looking at it in, in, in those terms. I, I've put this up. I'm, I'm happy to say I didn't do this. This is far too much work for me to deal with. Um, but Jean Greer, who is um, a trade principal now at, at Jage LLC, um, she was a, a longtime US trade negotiator, part of the office of the United States Trade Representative. So she has a long experience of this. And at our, at our conference at Nottingham, um, last year, she, she presented a paper on reciprocity. You can now find it in the PPLR, by the way. I put the reference at the bottom of the slide in case anybody's interested. Uh, but she saved me the work by making this wonderful, um, this wonderful matrix showing what the different restrictions are um, by the EU and all the other countries that I mentioned. So you can see the categories at the top here, drinking water, electricity, airport. So those are the utilities that are covered by, for example, the EU offer, but there are, there are restrictions in respect of all of these countries uh, for each of those different um, utility sectors, and that's based on, on reciprocal um, access. So they will, it will generally be um, restricted until commensurate access or equivalent access is granted in those, in those countries. So uh, as, yeah, I'm happy that Jean did all of that because I couldn't possibly have done that sort of um, slide, but it just demonstrates the importance of understanding these annexes very well and looking at them because coverage is not given. Even if you're named under Annex 3, you still have to look through all of these different um, reciprocal commitments. Uh, and in the, note, the notes to Annex 3 and, as Philippe mentioned, in the general notes in Annex 7, some of those are, are mentioned there. Um, now, this idea of, of equivalent economic value appears throughout um, the GPA. Um, and although this may not be of relevance now, it just, it just demonstrates how important this is. Um, let me start with the Article 5, Developing Countries. Alicia mentioned this early on, so I'm sure this is, this is going to be important at the moment um, for you, because there are possibilities of adopting transitional measures, such as having a phased-in addition of specific entities or sectors 
Um, so that, you know, it, it's possible that you would say, well, we won't immediately give coverage to a number of our SOEs, but we'll do so over a period of time. That would be a possibility. But if you do that, um, it is going to be subject to any of the terms negotiated with other parties in order to maintain an appropriate balance of opportunities under this agreement. So if you do that, the other parties are also going to check to see what the value is with or without these entities and whether they're going to be able to um, sustain that difference for the period that, that's been given, the, the transitional period that, that you opt for. So I think that's, that's going to be an interesting one, especially since um, uh, you may well want to, to look at things like that. Offsets, Alicia mentioned offsets, but this is also one of the, uh, the areas where the special and differential treatment gives you an opportunity to negotiate better access. Uh, by the way, only Israel, I think, has actually managed to negotiate offsets, so good luck. <laughs> but it is, a, it is a precedent and they've done it, so I, I think it's completely possible to do it. And then finally, let me just mention the modifications. Um, we're not there yet because we're still negotiating access. But once we've got access, um, then it may be that you would want to you would want to change the annex. Maybe there's a change in ownership if you've got state-owned enterprises, um, and there's a process for which, under which you can modify the entities covered by your annexes. Um, if somebody objects, there is a mechanism to deal with that. But regardless of any. Um, of any arbitration or mechanism that you put into, into place to deal with any objection, um, a, 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 a contracting party can still make the modification, even despite the objection, provided, and this is the important bit again, provided it's ready to accept the withdrawal of substantially equivalent coverage to the contracting party. So again, we see that if you do change your annexes, we're going to start the whole negotiation again because the parties are going to say, actually, but you've just taken out 20 million um, from the market. So if you're taking out 20 million, we're going to take out 20 million from our offer as well. So you can't do it without uh, a consequence. And, and that's why this, I think, is so important. It's all about the value. It's all about how much your offer is worth. However you dress it up, I think it's a question of um, money. As I say, I don't think we're there yet because we're still trying to negotiate access. But I do think that this idea means that in formulating the offer and in trying to determine which companies are going to be part of your Annex 3, um, it's going to be quite difficult. Raphael mentioned that different SOEs have different rules that they're applying. So I think this is going to become a bit of a political hot potato. We're going to say, well, actually, you can cover us. You can't cover us, but you can, you know, you can't cover us water, but you can cover the electricity or the gas or the telecoms, but not us, because our rules are different. So I think you're likely to have quite some issues, issues there. So as far as I'm concerned, this is going to be a very interesting space to watch. Um, and with that, I'll say thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I look forward to the rest of the, of the presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Peter. Uh, your presentation showed the difficulty on covering the SOEs. Uh, there is a kaleidoscope, as you said. Uh, we don't have the definition of an SOE under the GPA, uh, so it's uh, another uh, problem, another difficulty that we have. Uh, I found very interesting uh, what you said about the value of the enterprises and uh, the idea of offering this value to, to go to the GPA. Uh, the SOE uh, team, uh, the SOE subject is very uh, complex in, in Brazil, in my opinion, because uh, we still have a huge number of SOEs in our countries. Uh, some of them are controlled by the federal government, some of them by the state and the municipalities. So uh, it's a very complex environment as well. Uh, and uh, of course, they offer uh, very strategic uh, services like electricity, water, banking. So uh, this will be uh, probably one of the most uh, complex uh, issues that we'll uh, deal on the Brazil's assessment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we go to our uh, last uh, speaker of the day. Uh, Professor Alexandre Santos de, de Aragão. Professor Alexandre is a professor of administrative law, regulation, infrastructure, 
uh, at the University of the State of Rio de Janeiro, also on the Fundação Getúlio Vargas in Rio and GV Law in Sao Paulo. He is a state attorney of the state of Rio de Janeiro and partner of Alexandre, Alexandre Aragão Advogados, a law firm, a very well known law firm in, in Brazil. Uh, Professor Alexandre, uh, it's a great, great honor to have you here and, and you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be with all the colleagues here. I'd like to thank a lot to Cesar Pereira, Marcel Justin, Susan Wesmith for the invitation. And really, it's a very interesting point uh, what we'll talk about. I will start my presentation here. So, the colleagues have talked about some aspects that involve the subnational entities and the state owned companies. I will still talk about them but I will talk about them from the Brazilian law perspective. What, the, what are the relations between the GPA and some aspects of the Brazilian administrative and constitutional law that could difficult or emphasize the application of the GPA? First, First, we will talk about uh, some aspects of the GPA general structure. The, some aspects that are more related to the subnation entities and to the state-owned companies. Then we talk about each one of them. And then we'll finish talk about our experience with the procurement treaties that we had in Mercosul, what, what happened uh, in this matter in, the, in Mercosul. Well, the GPA could be good to all the entities, not only the central entities, for more efficient acquisitions and to permit the companies of the country to, or the state or the municipality to assess other markets. Here in Brazil, we have some economic difficulty about that. Why? Because some of the Brazilian states and municipalities, they are great buyers, but they are not great sellers. For example, the state of the northeast of Brazil. They are great consumers. They are more, they are more poor. So they, they, consume, they, they have to buy a lot of medicines, food, transport service. But he's uh, their internal economy is very weak and not international. Even in Brazil, they have a lot of difficulties to, to sell or to ha have services to other states. So I, I don't think we'll, if they have the interest to allow other countries to go to his procurement market without having private or even public companies that could go to international markets, at least nowadays. But this is a, a, a good thing about the GPA, if they have the, this condition. And it's very good of the GPA, his flexibility, as the colleagues have already, already said. Because you can join fully or 
less fully. So this is a great thing because of the annex thing. Uh, in the other day, a panelist was talking about the, uh, the, the less important of the GPA is the main text of the GPA. The, that the most important are the annexes. The, uh, he, he was saying that if you want to negotiate with the United States, for example, you can change everything in the main test. But the, the, the discussion is about the annexes that are the main discussion. So it's very interesting. This, uh, this thing. So it's part of the flexibility. And uh, for, for a Brazilian, I think that Vera Monteiro has already talked about that. Uh, for me, the, for the Brazilian law culture, for the Brazilian administrative culture, I think that the GPA is, could be very important to stimulate the modernizations of the Brazilian buildings, new kinds of public buildings in Brazil. Because the buildings in Brazil are no for their excessive formalism, complexity. And maybe later Peter could say it about something about that. In Brazil, in, when happens a case of corruption, they, the solution they wonder is to make more specific laws, more bureaucratic laws to forbid the corruption. And our experience is that it doesn't matter. The, the corruption happened if you have only standards, which in Brazilian case is very rare, or if you have very specific rules. Even if you don't want to give any discretionality to the public authority. So, this is a problem in the Brazilian administrative law. They want to fight against corruption with more specific and formal rules. And another case of corruption, so more specific and formal rules. And in the, uh, in the reality, it didn't solve the problem. So, One very interesting thing in the GPA general structure that I'd like to talk to you is about the negotiation, the competitive dialogue, which is in the USA, in the Europe, very known in practice, but in Brazil, it's, it's, it's still a disrupting moment. The only express provision we have is in the state-owned companies institute that mention a phase of negotiation, but only, only that. And the state-owned companies in their own rules, they didn't explore this point a lot. So I think that with the GPA, with, we really go there, with the GPA, maybe the Brazilian bidding system, we will absorb this culture of negotiating. And again, the fear, the prejudice the, the people have against negotiation is because of the corruption possibility. But even without a provision of a negotiation phase, the negotiation happened anyway in a, in, in a very bad terms. Well, start talking about the subnational entities. They are, as already my colleague said, meant to be in the Annex 2. In Brazil as a federal state, and Brazil will have the peculiarity as far as I know, Brazil is the only federal state that have three types of entities, the federal government or the union, the states and the municipalities also. 
This is the Brazilian federal peculiarity. And they all have autonomy, administrative autonomy. So how could the federal government, the central government, put their names into the Annex 2? The answer here is very similar to that one that we have in the American constitutional law. But we'll see it a little bit again later. But, well, first, in, in the matter of bidding, the Brazilian constitution establishes that the union could enact only general rules and the states and the municipalities to them are granted to the specific rules, to edit the specific rules. This is not an easy question. What are the general, in, in, in the Brazilian internal administrative law, what is general or is more specific? When the specific is becoming a little bit general and when the general is becoming a, a little bit specific. It's a, a, a great discussion, but in, anyway, the constitution said that for the union, they are, uh, it's granted to edit general rules to all the federal entities, even the local ones. And the states and the local ones could have their own specific rules. So the question is if, we, if the GPA applies to states and local government, and if the federal state could sign a treaty or agreement assuming obligation with affect states and local governments. In Brazil, at the central level, we have a distinction between the Brazilian federal state, which is the Republica Federativa do Brasil, and the union. That means the, also the whole territory. But the union, it's an internal entity, even it's broad. The international entity is the Brazilian federal state, it's the Republica Federativa do Brasil. The chief of the Republica Federativa do Brasil is the chief of the state. The chief of the Union, Union Federal is the chief of the government. But they are both the president. The president. It's like we have two entities, but with the same structure. But the Union Federal, it's only an internal personality. And the Republica Federativa do Brasil, it's an international personality. But the representation is made by the same person and the same other powers. It's like the Union lend his structure to the Republica Federativa do Brazil to act internationally. So only the union represents the Federative Republic of Brazil, international relations. And in these relations, the Republic Federative of Brazil includes the union itself, the states and the municipalities, relations with other countries, and with international organizations. The states and the municipalities, they don't have by themselves the power to have international relations. In Brazil, we don't have yet treaties about public procurement, but we have a very important precedent about tax treaties. Sometimes, a lot of times, the Brazilian federal states sign treaties 
given exemption of taxes. But taxes, they are that belong to the states and to municipalities. So when the discussion, could the federal government sign a treaty about states and municipalities taxes? And the answer is yes. We have this very important precedent of the Supreme Court that explain with more, with better words, what I just said. It's a, a lesson of Brazilian international public law that when acting in international relations, the Republica Federativa do Brazil is acting in the name of all federal entities, the Union, the states, and the municipalities. So, the Republica Federativa do Brasil has the power to sign the GPA, including states and municipalities. The same thing that happens in the United States which is another federal state. And as well as the, in, in, the, in the United States, it doesn't mean that the federal government will do this without listening to the states and the municipalities. I think that politically it, it won't happen. In terms of law, it could happen. But politically, I think it's very difficult that this thing could be done. But anyway, even we have the discussion or not, the GPA is so general and flexible that could be considered, in my vision, a general act, guidelines, which are already the rules that the union can impose to all entities. We saw a little bit ago that in Brazilian constitution, the union can enact only general rules. And the GPA is more general than the Brazilian general law itself, the law 866, almost the number of the beast. And in this perspective, the GPA, even without the discussion that we had about taxes, I think that by, by the constitution itself, the GPA can be, uh, can be seen as a general rule and applied to all entities in potential. But also, in practice, I think that the para diplomacy can will be used here, and we have a agency in federal level that works on it. It's the Assessoria Especial de Assuntos Federativos and Parlamentares. It's an agency belonging to the federal central government that deals with this relations between the states and other countries. And the negotiation could be, has this, uh, his, has this very specific and special place to happen. Maybe we'll follow the uh, North American attitude, for example, uh, the, the states, the Union, the American Union, only brought the states that agreed with the, to join the GPA. So maybe the Brazilian more rich states that have a more internationalized economy, maybe they will 
agree to join the, the GPA. But other states that don't have a, a internationalized economy, economy, most of the times they even have a nationalized economy. Maybe they, it's, it will not be interested, interesting to them. Well, now we jump to the state-owned companies that Peter have already talked so well and learned about a lot. And they are meant to be in the Annex 3. And as Peter said, it's very, even in Brazil, it's very difficult to have a specific concept of the state-owned companies. But in the precedents, we have, I think that the most probable concept is that the state-owned companies is the company that the state owns more than a half of the voting rights. It's a formal concept, but it's, it's in, in law and it's being applied by the tribunals. So in Brazil, we have this concept. And in Brazil, we have another constitutional discussion about the GPA application to the state-owned companies. Why? In Brazil, we, the constitution have two provisions of bidding laws. The constitution has a provision of a general bidding law to all public administration, which was the mentioned law 8666 nowadays. And the constitution has another provision only to the state-owned companies. To be more dynamic, to be more adapted to the market, the Article 173 of the, our Constitution establishes that the state-owned companies will have a specific institute for their procurement, for their tenders, for their buildings. So the question we have to make is, could the GPA violate that constitutional article, violate that specific institute that has already been enacted? It's the law 13303. Because the GPA would be applied to the entire administration. As the GPA is applied to the entire administration, would it violate the constitutional provision of a specific institute to the state-owned companies? In my opinion, no. Because we will have the purpose of the Article 173 of the Constitution, we won't consider it unconstitutional. We will have in mind only the letters of the Article 173, maybe we will have to consider it unconstitutional, its application to the state-owned companies of Brazil. But if we, we, we read the GPA, and we, if we have in mind the purpose of that art, constitutional article, we will agree that the state-owned companies could be written in the Annex 3. Why? Because the purpose of the Article 173 is to give more flexibility. It's to give a more pro-market kinds of tenders of bidings to the state-owned companies. And in my view, the GPA are more 
adapted to the nature of the state-owned companies, mainly those acting in a competitive market, then their specific statute itself that even better than the law 8666 is still very formal and complex. I know that GPA was not created having mag, as Professor Su said in his opening, was not having in mind the state-owned companies operating in competition. But since in Brazil they are obliged to the bidding specific statute anyway, I think that would make a lot of sense and would be very good to the state-owned companies, to the GPA, if the GPA could be applied to them. Now we have to do a not very optimist parallel with Mercosul and with other procurement agreements that Brazil signed. In first place, all the Brazilian procurement treaties that has been signed by the president, which is the more, most important is the Mercosul, but we have also with Peru, with Chile, none of them was approved by the Congress. So they were signed by the president, but they are not enforced. They are not enforced because in the Brazilian constitutional law, we have the two powers combination to put a treaty in force in Brazil, the president and the Congress. And any of these treaties were signed, were signed. even the Mercosul government procurement rules. And more than that, even if they are approved by the Congress, none of these treaties, even the government procurement of Mercosul, which is the main treaty that Brazil, general treaty that Brazil participates, included any subnational entities and did include, include also any state-owned companies. And for Mercosul, may, maybe for the Brazilian South states, would be very nice to participate, but because they, they, they have borders with the other Mercosul countries. So our experience, until now at least, it's not to include the, any subnational entities and the state-owned companies. And our experience is not to approve these treaties by the Congress. They, they are signed by the president, but then again, the Congress didn't approve it. Well, these not very optimist words, uh, with these not very optimist words, I finished my exposition, but I think that one of the good things in life is to do things for the first time. So I think, and I hope that for the first time we sign a treaty, we have it approved by the Congress and we have it applied to some, at least some subnational entities and to some state-owned companies. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Alexandre. Uh, your presentation confirms all the complexity regarding uh, subnational entities and especially SOEs. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have received uh, three questions from the audience. I would like to address the first one to uh, Alessia. Um, Alessia, uh, the question is, uh, how prepared uh, do you think Brazil is to collect and process meaningfully data on public procurement in preparation for the negotiation process or future monitoring of compliance with the GPA? 
Can you tell us something about that? Yes, uh, Rafael. Well, well, meaningful data on public procurement. Actually, the consultancy I rendered the, the European Union it was aimed also at the collection of such data. They wanted to find out how large the market is, how much they buy, the central, the subcentral states and municipalities and the SOEs, how much they, they buy and, and, and how they can collect this data. So of course, we did not do this because we had the legal part of the job, but Fundação Getúlio Vargas with Jorge Pires as a consultant, uh, helped a lot on this, okay? This was one of the parts um, he, he, he carried out. And Clenio Barbosa, for example, from INSPER, uh, he's been collecting this data for six years. It's basically uh, uh, the, the, his, his whole thesis of his line of study. So I do think Brazil has control of this data uh, in a meaningfully uh, uh, way. I mean, uh, of course, we have municipalities, we have so many small um, uh, entities operating procurement, but the basic uh, data can, yes, for sure be collected, especially the SOEs. Actually, this uh, work uh, showed that, that the, the central and subcentral, uh, the central government, only the federal government uh, spends the same amount as the SOEs. So we can cover that. Uh, there are specialists prepared for that here in Brazil. Thank you, Alessia. Uh, the second question I would like to address to Felipe. Uh, I'll read it here. Um, Felipe, uh, in construction contracts, is it common for the GPA parties to include BOT types of contracts, such as infrastructure concessions in the GPA coverage? Or uh, is the usual practice to include only construction contracts without private operation? Um, I, I think I can specify. Um, um, so at least in their market access commitment, um, this is something relatively new. This is not that common, but as part of the GPA renegotiations that was successfully concluded in 2012, uh, a small number of parties have explicitly included uh, BOTs, uh, works, uh, work concessions, or other type of PPPs in their commitments. Um, so actually, at, up to now, I think there's four GPA parties that have included that in, in, in their annex dealing with construction services, and these are the European Union, and the EU does it on, on a reciprocity basis, and it's only offered to a, a limited number of parties. You have Japan, Korea, and, and now you also have Montenegro. So uh, the short answer is this is not that common, but this is a growing trend, I would say. Thank you, Felipe. Um, the, the third question I would like to address to Professor Peter. Uh, Peter, uh, in many situations, SOEs that compete in certain markets are allowed to procure goods and services without a public tender. If such an SOE is covered by the GPA, will such direct procurement be subject to the GPA requirements, uh, notices, non-discrimination, and so forth? Or will the SOE be automatically uh, subject to the GPA requirements only when it's required to conduct a public competitive, competitive uh, tender? I think the, the answer to that last bit is no, that would be too easy. That would be an easy way out of the, out of the commitments, I think. If the SOE is covered, and, and as um, Philippe mentioned earlier on, it has to be covered in terms of type of contract and threshold, and that it's an SOE, if it's covered, then it has to follow the provisions of the GPA and public tender. It could still do direct contracting, but only under the conditions that are allowed by the GPA. So the GPA would then automatically apply and those provisions need to be followed, subject to the flexibilities I mentioned. I mean, there are some flexibilities for Annex 3 entities, um, although I'm not sure that that would... Um, well, it, it does. I mean, for the SOEs, I think they are quite useful, especially when you can have uh, multi-use lists and the notice of planned procurement as methods of advertising that 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 is that we use that in Europe as well and that's a huge benefit a huge flexibility for state-owned enterprises but in principle subject to those flexibilities yes they have to apply the GPA 
and direct contracting only when the conditions of the GPA are met. Thank you, Peter. It's very clear. Um, so uh, unfortunately, we don't have more time. Uh, I think it was a very productive panel. I'd like to thank again, professors Alessia, Filippi, Peter and Alexandre for uh, all these uh, uh, very interesting and, and profound presentations. Uh, I would like to also uh, uh, to uh, invite all the audience to uh, check the previous uh, sessions that are available on, on the IDP uh, channel on YouTube. Uh, there, are, there is a lot of good material and uh, they show all the complexity uh, under the Brazil's assessment to the GPA. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you for the audience, for the questions. And uh, I uh, finish here. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.